Welcome back, everyone, to theCUBE's coverage here at Black Hat. I'm John Furrier, your host of theCUBE, day two of wall-to-wall -wall coverage. We are here in the Mandalay Bay. John Spiegel, who's the CTO at HPE for Cybersecurity and SASE. John, great, great to see you. Thanks for coming on theCUBE. It's great. I'm excited to be here. <laughs> and uh, it's the show's already started and uh, things are happening. What a what a what a interesting time to have Black Hat two weeks ago. We saw the, the disruption um, that got everyone's attention. And then just overall the, the inflection point we're in with you know, infrastructure, uh, it's a, and AI's impact on, yes. on uh, all the action in the infrastructure. You're seeing uh, leadership come at the silicon level. You're seeing a lot, it's cool to be hardware guy back. It's like, okay, <laughs> hardware's cool again. You know, more servers, you can't get enough compute these days. Uh, and, and so you see the shift at the infrastructure layer. Data layer, you're seeing the rise of the data lake. You see Snowflake and Databricks. Um, we just had an event last week in, in our Palo Alto studio called SuperCloud 7, where you know we're starting to see signs now that the data platform, this next platform is coming, where you know, data needs to be available um, because of the Gen AI need for applications. So open table formats are driving you know, changes there for interoperability. Uh, and you're seeing data being decoupled from the database. Yep. Okay, now you see the rise of catalogs uh, not the way it was before. So you start to see, you know, stuff that was traditionally boring, governance, table formats. We are seeing a massive shift in kind of how things are, are developing technically, mm -hmm. because you can see this wave coming in. It's secular, it's real, it's a category. Um, and it's going to be an opportunity for folks who can, who can manage this transition. And, you know, you know, in tech, it's always win in transitions. And uh, HPE acquired Juniper, that's going to probably close soon. So you're in the middle of all the action. Yeah. Explain what you do, the, your group, <laughs> how HP in cyber exists, what's their purpose. Obviously, HP, we cover that really strongly, but like, talk about their cyber capabilities and, and, and what they do. Yeah, so really what it's about is the network and, and securing the network. Um, I, my uh, entry into HPE was part of an acquisition, Access Security, in March of 2023. And really what that was about was... Um, SD-WAN, uh, in, in my opinion, it was the technology of the last decade. I mean, everything was about SD-WAN from an infrastructure perspective. Uh, that was really the accelerant that happened. Uh, and the challenge with SD-WAN was how to secure it. You had multiple ways of doing it. You could uh, send the data back to your data center, and when you did that, you slowed down applications. Uh, you could put a firewall out at the edge from a scale perspective, hard to manage, high cost or you could send it to a central location. Again, you had that latency problem. And uh, what came along was this concept called SASE that was uh, really fostered by the team over at, at Gartner. And what they wanted to do was really take what you did well in the data center, but cloudify it. So take what in the past were hardware devices. Uh, maybe it was a firewall, maybe it was a, a CASB style device running inside your data center or VPN uh, or a, a SWIG device transform that into software, and then place that at the edge of the network in the form of what they call a point of presence. So transforming what in the past was hardware into software, and then thereby uh, re eliminating that challenge with latency. Uh, and that is a, that pivot happened in 2019. Surprisingly, 2020 hit. Yeah. And everything changed, as we know, <laughs> uh, and this thing called remote access became very yeah. important. Yeah. Uh, and this, uh, this, uh, uh, this security stack for SASE um, really took off at that point because it really addressed those challenges of um, companies that were you know, pivoting from on-prem applications to cloud applications. Uh, they needed to secure it because you have people at home and, and people working together. You know, the, the father may, if they have kids at home, the father may be working at one company, the wife at another company, and then you had your kids. Uh, so how do you segment that data when you, your network is not traditionally your network? Uh, and SSE was the, the way to yeah. do it with ZTNA. Um, so uh, that was kind of where I started in at that moment. I joined a company called Access Security that was very focused on the, the ZTNA, solving that ZTNA yeah. problem. Uh, they also, uh, we also created a, a SWIG and, and filled out that, that portfolio. Uh, but um, kind of to, to solve the problem of security with, with SD-WAN, uh, SSE was the method, SASE was the method, mm -hmm. and HPE, Aruba Networking, realized we needed to get in on that game because we were solving for SD-WAN, but we weren't solving for the security side. And that is where the primary growth is seen. 
Yeah, it's interesting you bring that up because one of the things we're seeing now, that was a moment in time where who would have forecasted that the remote worker would be 100, almost 100%. Yeah. And, you know, at best people forecast maybe 20, 30%. So massive shift, but also put the cloud trend back on the table because then you had cloudification Accelerated happen. it. So you had all this acceleration and all the budgets were there. So I think we're kind of seeing the same thing with Generative AI. It is, it is a shift. It's like, this is happening. People are recognizing it. Uh, but Generative AI is a little slower to kind of grow because the applications aren't truly ready. But you start to see the boardrooms and recognize that like work at home with yep. COVID, yeah. Gen AI is a generational thing. It's going to happen. And budgets and activity on it are, are, are saying, because it's it's a whole nother thing. So how do you look at security in that context? Because you have infrastructure that has requirements and you got a data opportunity. What's the thinking right now uh, around securing what will become probably more surface area? I mean, you talk about, you know, yep. zero trust and, you know, edge point, uh, endpoints. You're talking about now, people bringing Gen AI into the office, into the network. Yeah. I mean, okay, <laughs> more surface area yeah. to attack. Well, it's not only that, it's also about IoT too. We're seeing a proliferation of devices and it's not just within uh, the factories or, or uh, manufacturing. It's actually in the office itself. Uh, you, know, you got printers, you've got, uh, you just think about what happens in an office these days video systems coming in, people are bringing in other devices. Yeah. Uh, I've even seen virtual assistants and robots moving around. Somebody wants to you know, do a video call or a face-to-face -face call. They may be at home, the person's in the office. Um, and that is, is, is one of the biggest challenges right now, in my mind, as being you know, somebody who's more network focused. How do you secure those devices, especially if you can't apply identity to them? We did that in the yeah. past with ACLs, very clunky. Uh, we had some other techniques, very difficult. But in a day and an age where these devices are proliferating and a lot of them are consumer-based, how do you secure those? So <laughs> that's an area, I think, uh, where we can start to leverage yeah. AI to you know, target, understand, profile these devices, but then make sense of it. Yeah. The humans have a hard time at scale. Uh, and I think that's, that's really where the opportunity is. It's interesting, you put a device, if it has a processor, and it has the IP connection, right. malware could be on there. Yeah. And with AI, multimodal, you're seeing computer vision, really a hot application for these smaller devices, little cameras. Right. They're gonna be everywhere. We're seeing sensing, all kinds of new applications. This is a tsunami, it's completely a Cambrian explosion of app development. Right. So how how do you look at that? Do you just lock everything down? What's the what's the approach? What's the what do you guys see as a recommended direction for CISOs to start taking? Because you know, they're 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 kind of hurting right now. They you gotta look at this and say, hey, you know, I got more product sprawl. I got more no, consolidation was supposed to happen. That right. really happened. It, it, yeah. um, I got risk management now to really worry about. And I got to interoperate, integrate, and rationalize my portfolio. Like what's And the, you have legal concerns as well. If you're a privately traded company, the SEC, uh, you, you, certain reporting requirements, uh, you have to attest that you're, you, you have your cybersecurity in, in a good way. Uh, it's a tough life to be a CISO <laughs> right now. And I think the other challenge that they have is they're not getting a lot more budget, maybe a little bit, um, but it, it, for the most part, you're being asked to do more with less. So how do you overcome that? Um, and, and I think you know what we're heading and our, our thesis is that uh, it's really about AI. It's really about taking the things that we can do uh, as HPE, Aruba Networking, uh, leverage our network background, uh, the mm -hmm. switches we have, the APs we have, the intelligence that we have put into these devices, our DNA. Uh, it, it, I mean, if you look at what we did as Aruba, we put a lot more into our APs than some of the other vendors did. Mm -hmm. uh, there's security mechanisms within it. So how do we leverage those uh, and take the telemetry from those devices, put it into our cent central uh, platform, and then start to provide insights, recommendations, um, understand what the device does, what is its meaning, uh, what is its purpose, what's the why behind it, yeah. and then uh, start to apply policy or at least recommend policy based on that. Mm -hmm. uh, the days of doing static, access lists, there's not enough time for it. Yeah. These devices pop up, they're generally commercial devices. Uh, they don't have a very strong IP stack. Uh, they don't have an Okta ID or a Azure AD account. Um, you've got to figure out where they are, how they pop up, and you can't control it. So um, AI is the big, the big key here. You know, one of the big things most most people think they know everything in their network, but some of the things aren't even they don't know yeah. what's out there. So yeah. discoverability and one identifying threats. Um, networking is where the last you know 
action is. You see the footprints, you see the packets. Packets move from point A to point B. It's stored somewhere, you got storage. So you got, you know, you got the classic storage compute and networking to look at. And the trend right now we're seeing in AI, some of the best AI companies that are on the consumer side, you see, you see what they're doing is they're getting closer to the hardware. Mm -hmm. They're getting closer to the network. Kernel developers are up, well, not up, but in demand more than ever before. So you start to see that low level access coding is one. And the other one is, is that with networking, you have security for networking and then networking for security. Right. So, so, exactly. you, so this is, a, we're in a kind of this weird kind of dual mode where, okay, we got access to connections. Yep. And networking could help because you see patterns. You can look at them. AI can look at them. So talk about that dynamics. It's not just security for networking. Networking also helps security. Yeah, I mean, what networking's about is optimal pathing. And you, you hit it. It l nailed it out of the park there. Network's all about optimizing, making things faster, moving those packets as quickly as possible from point A to point B. Security, on the other hand, is all about looking at it, inspecting it, understanding the risk. Should that packet really go to that destination? Uh, and that slows things down. So you gotta, you gotta really kind of bring them together. Mm -hmm. And inserting what I call legacy devices inside there that basically inspect them all the time, I think is the wrong approach. We, we gotta work together. And that's really where uh, we feel there's an opportunity and an advantage to leverage, again, tools like AI. Uh, we announced, um, NDR, uh, Network Detect and Response, at, at Black Hat, there's a big announcement around that. Uh, and we keep on adding more and more features into our products. Uh, as well with SSE, uh, we also see an opportunity to decomplexify policy creation for um, the network administrators and the yeah. security administrators. Because if you think about it today, uh, you know, we talked a little bit about hybrid work, um, and it's here to stay. Yeah. Yeah, we, we, we thought, okay, well, everyone's going to go work at home, and then things are going to return back to normal. They never did. A uh, recent Gallup poll showed that 80% of workers are still remote. That's a combination of definitely always remote and hybrid. So it's we're four years in. <laughs> it ain't changing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then the other side of it is the people that want to work remote are probably the more talented ones. So now they have choice. Uh, in the past, I, I'm from Portland, Oregon. Um, I worked in a, a, an area of 15 miles continuously. Um, I wouldn't go beyond that. Now, I can work for a company uh, you know, that's halfway on the other side of the planet. Yeah. I, I work for an Israeli company. Uh, I could work for a company that's based out of, of Houston, Texas, which I do now. Um, where I work really doesn't matter, uh, but how I'm secured does. But it also matters when I go to the campus and the branch, um, how do I get on that? Am I getting a secure connection? Mm -hmm. Because that could be another avenue, another area for attack, and, and you need to monitor that. Interesting, you mentioned um, uh, you know, stat static lists uh, and policy, you brought a policy, that's interesting. Now you have AI to assist. Yes. So you can actually create policies on the fly or new ways to kind of use the resource. How advanced are we on that front yet on networking? Are we, it seems like we're, we got some great progress in that where networking is a little bit more robust and yes. more agile. Yeah, I think that's an area that's uh, under development. Um, it's certainly an area that we're investing in. We see the opportunity for that. Um, I think the challenge is trust. Mm -hmm. It all comes down to trust at the end of the day, right? Um, and do I trust the policy decisions from that uh, controller to apply those policies. And I think that's the, another area where we're iterating on is, can we take uh, essentially a digital twin, mm -hmm. uh, take your network, because we can see it within our controller, can we take that network, separate it out, look at it, apply change, and understand how that change will impact my network. And that's based on you know, almost real-time data because we're collecting all this telemetry. So we can look back you know, 24 yeah. hours, if I apply this policy, what will my network look like? Will it go dark? Mm -hmm. Will everything <laughs> turn off and I will get phone calls? Or if I apply it in this way, will everything stay in, in the area that I wanna attack and, and, and defend against? Will that change? Yeah. That's a, I think that's really where we have to be. Because as somebody who has been a leader in the, in the network space for a company uh, and had that responsibility and knew that yeah. if I, you know, my team made a change and yeah. the phone started ringing, I knew you know, yeah. the CISO is gonna call me, the CIO is gonna call me, it's gonna be a long night. Uh, the ability to take a look at it, understand how that change is gonna impact the network, that's the most important thing. If you can develop that trust, you can see what's yeah. going to happen, then you can start to apply policy. 
to your point, I think we're still early yeah, in that yeah. space, but it's going to develop ra rather rapidly. I mean, SASE has to get faster and, and smarter because more devices are coming on. You mentioned it earlier. Yeah. And, and access modes, the road, what device, where are they? What's the other identities do they have? What other credentials do they have? Yeah. Interesting, interesting access kind of theory. It's not just an active directory or some sort of list. Yeah. It's moving beyond that. It's more of a, you know, more of a graph. Yeah. What, what, what do you have? It seems to be a trend here. Yeah, definitely. Uh, and then, you know, the other piece, we, we talked a little bit about SASE and, and what SASE is. Uh, SD-WAN plus this technology stack from security of SSE. We feel like it's missing something. Mm -hmm. It's missing what happens in the campus and the branch. Um, SASE is great for remote access. It's great for SD-WAN connectivity into the branch. But what happens when that packet's dumped off onto the LAN? Does it solve for that? Uh, and that's an area that we feel yeah. like we have that opportunity, that advantage, yeah. because we own the network. Yeah. We, if we are the provider for your APs, for your switches, that gives us the opportunity to help you uh, yeah. simplify your network, but also secure it in a new way, mm -hmm. leveraging the principles of SASE and extending that into the campus it's, of branch. It's not just a remote thing, it's really, no. the, it is distributed computing, it's a cloud native, cloud operating model yeah. running distributedly. Right, but ZTNA isn't just remote yeah. access. Yeah, exactly. It got pinned with remote access due to the events of 2020, but it's a lot more than that. It's, it's essentially architecting your network and, and segmenting it off. Uh, and we need to get back to that. Yeah, I think that's telemetry is key. I want to ask you about the show. Um, first of all, thanks for the commentary. Yeah. It was great, great commentary there. The show here, what's the main story? What, what's, in your view, what's the hot, what's the most important story being talked about this week at Black Hat, if you had the summer? So if I, if I didn't three. say AI, <laughs> of course, <laughs> I would be remiss. I mean, that is all AI over. and workforce shortage. Uh, yeah, 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 workforce shortage. Uh, y y not enough net, not enough security engineers, uh, CISOs, CISO burnout is, is actually a topic. Um, I've, I've had a few conversations around uh, just because the responsibilities are becoming so great. Uh, in the past, it was a very technically oriented job, but now security is horizontal mm -hmm. across an organization. So uh, what a CISO is and what they do, yeah. it's evolved. Uh, so that's a topic. Um, the other one is, and this is surprising, and it was, it was a theme that uh, came out of RSA, segmentation. It, it, it's an oldie that's come yeah. back. Uh, but if you think about it, AI and what AI requires is massive data lakes. You have to segment that yeah. data yeah. off. You have to, to uh, really protect it. Uh, so segmentation has come back hot as well. So yeah. I think the role of, of what a SIM is, the human capital involved in, in identifying threats with automation coming around yes. the corner is an interesting one I heard. <laughs> next gen SIM really is not really next gen SIM. It's going to be like last gen SIM. Yeah. A whole nother generation of kind of analysis is, kind of, is coming big time. Yeah. That seems to be the story. The other one that we're hearing, I want to get your reaction to real quick as we wrap up is, there's also a trend for some of the bigger distributed computing customers looking at to complete reset the platform yep. from scratch. Yep. There, there's some design going on. Um, do I vertically integrate end-to-end -end workflows? What is the best architecture and, and foundational infrastructure look for them to have for the next 20 years? And they're looking at it like a do-over. Yeah. Um, what's your reaction to that? I think, well, I don't want to talk too much about <laughs> futures here because uh, I think you know the answer to this and we'll, we'll hear more about it as we get into later in the year. But I think that's one of the things that's driving it. I think there's a huge opportunity right now to rethink the network uh, from a data center layer perspective. You need low latency. You need non-blocking to make AI successful. And then you start to see what happens next. Uh, the AI co-pilots are now moving over to uh, laptops and, and yeah. those PC devices. So you probably need to rethink- Opportunity the, for a hacker. Exactly, exactly. I mean, I'm a hacker, I love that. You, you got to rethink the campus and the branch network um, as well. So I think there's an opportunity there too. And then tying it together yeah. with uh, you know a centralized control mechanism like we have with HPE yeah. Aruba Networking. And it also starts to address some of the challenges with the workforce. Yeah. Uh, getting people in, especially in the networking space that is, I think you, you mentioned it, it's, it's kind of the last bastion right. of very challenging technologies. I mean, we still, BGP is, yeah. is the protocol <laughs> that runs the internet. How old is it? It, 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 we're hearkening back to the early hey, 90s the, here. If the plumbing Maybe works, don't break, don't right. fix it. You know, right. let, it, let, right. it work, let it go. But it's a very challenging <laughs> protocol. Um, I've, I've configured it before and you don't want to make a mistake. Um, and that's the underpinnings yeah. of this. 
uh, getting people into the into that realm takes a long time. A lot of training that has to happen. And if we can abstract the, the complexity of it, yeah. leveraging a gen AI uh, mechanism, a chat GTP interface to say, hey, you, you've yeah. got a problem over here. I recommend that you take this action uh, and then being able to apply it. And not just doing that at a high level network engineer level, mm -hmm but down to a knock yeah. uh, where they can really kind of take a, a, a look at it, provide that information to that high-end engineer and, and is gonna nod his head or her head yeah. and say, yeah, apply that, fix the problem. I think that's really where it's it is. It's interesting. It's a networking, data, and risk management paradigm. Yes. All those are three key variables. In fact, the Cube Research was the first research analyst firm that actually identified compute and store as separating. That created the hyperconvergence. But it's also how we make it simpler. Yeah, exactly. How do we make it simpler? Because we can't keep do going down this path of complexity, complexity, complexity. We've got to simplify it. I think the cataloging, the governance piece yes. in the data is a, is a tell sign. So we're watching that closely. John, thanks for coming on theCUBE. We'll hey, certainly see you. you again now that we know that you're at HPE. Yeah. You've been hiding from us <laughs> on theCUBE. You know, we we got to get to you soon. It's a great area. It's cybersecurity yeah. for HPE. Thank thanks you. for coming on. Yeah, thank All you. Right. CUBE coverage here at Black Hat. I'm John Furrier, host of theCUBE. Thanks for watching.